For ZDNet, I'm Dan Patterson, and today's interview is with Kathy Baxter. She is the Principal Architect of Ethical AI Practice at Salesforce. And in this interview, she talks about ways that we can ensure AI systems are developed and deployed without perpetuating existing social bias or even creating new biases. Uh, how can we make AI systems that are transparent and understandable for us mere mortals, for us humans? And importantly, how can we preserve our privacy in this era of big data. Kathy has a big job, a real job, and a hard job that will help determine the future of artificial intelligence systems for generations. Kathy, um, so first, I know that these are, are massive questions, AI ethics, but uh, it, they're kind of essential questions, especially now as we're laying the foundation for technologies that will um, come from these innovations of generative AI. How can we ensure that AI systems are built, are developed and deployed without perpetuating existing social biases or creating new ones? This is one of the fundamental questions that we have been uh, talking about and and. Um, women of color in particular has been have been asking this question and doing research in this area for years now. Uh, I think I'm thrilled to see many people uh, talking about this, particularly with the use of generative AI. Um, but the 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 things that we need to do fundamentally are asking who benefits and who pays from this technology, whose voices are included, where are the data sets that we are drawing from? Are they being scraped off the web from sites that are not representative of everyone's voices? Um, who is at the table developing this technology and uh, identifying harms? Who are we going out and interviewing in our, in our user research to understand how well the technology works or doesn't work, what the intended and unattended impacts are on these communities. If companies aren't investing deeply in asking those questions and doing the work to understand it, and then you know, making the changes to the technology to ensure that everyone is represented equally, um, then we are we will only continue to perpetuate or amplify the existing harms that we see in our society today. I, you know, before we get ahead of ourselves, I, I have to ask, and I I know that these are huge questions that uh, entire PhD uh, courses are based on, but what is social bias and how does it in how how are ai systems infused with bias the data sets that we choose to use to train these ai systems uh, we know, we've seen research studies that show that they are not representative of everyone, that they do contain biases, whether it's image data sets, um, where they are predominantly uh, one race, or they are lacking cultural differentiation, um, or the labels that are applied to images that, um, uh, you know, Add, instill um, stereotypes in them. So that is one of the one of the um, first sources of it. But then additionally, asking how these systems are applied to individuals. So for example, surveillance technology being predominantly used in um, black and brown and poor neighborhoods, um, facial recognition being used in um, uh, um, stores that are in poor neighborhoods. Whenever we decide to apply um, applications unevenly in society, then again, we just end up perpetuating the, the, the stereotypes that already exist. So how can we make these AI systems uh, transparent and understandable to normal people? Not only is the technology pretty challenging to grasp, but uh, uh, the data that that it's trained on is pretty challenging. How do we make this understandable to the layperson? 
there's been research that has shown when you begin by prioritizing, when you're developing the models, if you begin by prioritizing making the models explainable and then work on improving the accuracy, you're going to have a much more explainable uh, system than if you first prioritize accuracy and after the fact, you're trying to trying to do the explainability of it. With generative AI, um, this can be even more difficult to do because the systems are so complex and the AI systems are, dre- are generating net new content. They're not just finding something that already exists and delivering it to you, but they are looking at massive amounts of data and creating something completely new that hadn't existed. So explaining how that happened is is incredibly difficult. Um, It may be possible to cite sources. So being able to point to these are the places where, you know, in the case of Salesforce with Service Cloud, um, uh, giving answers to customer questions, you can go back and you can sort uh, or cite these are the knowledge articles that uh, that the system referenced to generate this answer. Um, there, there's been some really cool work with chain of thought prompts where um, uh, you make the AI system explain each step, kind of like when we were kids in elementary school and your math teacher made you show your work. You make the AI system show its work for how it came to the answer that it did. So there are a number of different ways that we might be able to do this, but it's also really important to do user research and make sure that, A, the explanations, uh, the way that you have provided it, that the user can understand it they identify, uh, or they're able to see if there's uh, in uncertainty, because sometimes these systems are very certain and they're very wrong answers. So being able to communicate uncertainty, um, knowing what to do about it, how to act on it, and then incentivizing the user to be able to act on it rather than speed being a priority. And it doesn't matter if this answer that was generated was the right one or not. It's what the system said. So that's the answer that I'm going to use. Uh, so how, I I think you kind of answered this, but how do we protect individuals' privacy and and ensure the AI is used responsibly? I know that's kind of a loaded question. (laughs) Um, uh, we have, uh, our five guidelines for responsible generative AI, and one of them is, uh, around, um, Uh, respecting data provenance. And so when we are training our own models, we only use customer data when we have their consent. So being transparent when you are using someone's data, allowing them to opt in, allowing them to go back and say when when they no longer want their data to be included um, uh, is really important. I've uh, read that there are some artists that they are adding uh, tags like to the metadata of the art that they post online and they add a tag that it's AI generated so that when these systems are going through and looking for content to scrape off of the web, these systems usually will skip content that is AI generated. And so to protect their images, then they add this tag so the systems will skip over it, creating um, uh, systems where um, uh, you can also take a look, be able to identify, does this content that the system is generating, does it match? Is it like an a, a exact match of anything that was in the training data? If so, don't, don't, you know, don't put that, don't release that output. Um, if does it look like there's any PII, an email address, a phone number, a social security number, if it looks like PII, don't output it. So there's a number of things that we can do both from the data collection as well as the data output. It feels like we are racing um, to to innovate or, or out innovate. When I say we, I mean, uh, uh, not we, but those who create uh, these new generative AI systems are, are in massive competition, speed competition with each other. So how do we make sure that this 
actually happens and how do we maintain, you know, not in an Isaac Asimov sci-fi way, but how do we maintain human control and autonomy over these increasingly autonomous AI systems? Being transparent when content is uh, AI generated is uh, incredibly valuable. Uh, keeping a human in the loop. So giving that control to the user uh, of, again, giving information to help individuals know, is this information that's been generated? Is it trustworthy? Should I use this? Empower them to know how to check it uh, and then choose. Give them the power to use this or not use this is going to be incredibly important in making sure that this technology really does work for the individual. I, can we keep these systems safe or can we make sure that these systems are safe, reliable and still robust and usable? I, I mean, it, it seems like there's a tension between those two um, uh, desires. We have to. <laughs> Is that can we, we? We we must. We have to. It's not. It's not optional. Uh, you know, I I am biased. I will recognize my own bias. I am biased. Uh, the I am a visiting AI fellow with NIST, and I'm very proud of the AI uh, NIST uh, or AI risk management framework that NIST created. I think this will become a, a standard that um, regulators can use for auditing systems. This gives us a common framework, a common language that we can all come to and identify potential risks and then sharing solutions. There is no one company, there's no one organization that has all of the answers. And it is vital that we all come together, public, private, civil society, all coming together to figure out the solutions. Because at the end of the day, all of our kids are using the same technology. We're all you know, members of the same, uh, same society with the same governmental outcomes. And so it behooves all of us, regardless of what organization we work for, to come together and figure out how do we put in the guardrails? How do we develop and use this technology as safely as possible? And I think the approach that NIST took, bringing together you know, over 240 experts from government, private industry, nonprofit, academia, all of these individuals over, an, uh, you know, over a one-year period or 18-month period to create this, that's the model that we should be following. What what are the consequences if we get this wrong? There there are a lot of uh, a lot of predictions, a lot of concerns about worst case scenarios. The we already see today some of this um, happening with individual uh, or innocent um, black men getting arrested because uh, they were misidentified with uh, facial recognition, um, uh, errors in um, uh, recommendations that get made for uh, parole or other outcomes, um, AI that generates images that um, uh, are supposed to be a fake people, but turns out they're actually real people, um, or uh, AI generation systems that create sexualized uh, images of young girls and, and women of color. Like they're, they're, we, we are already seeing today many harmful outcomes. And so um, they, will, they will only continue if we don't put safeguards in place um, uh, to, to to, to prevent those, to make it as hard as possible to do the wrong thing. Um, last question. It's kind of sci-fi, but uh, there is chatter everywhere. It seems like it's unavoidable. The talk about AGI, artificial general intelligence, is unavoidable. And I know Nick Bostrom wrote about this, about super intelligence over a decade ago. Uh, where where are we going? What is the future of AI? Are we really headed towards these smarter than human systems or is this hype and hyperbole? I think the timeline matters a lot and we don't, we should not sacrifice the, the harm that uh, is possible today 
and, and focus solely on um, uh, potential future harms. We need to make sure that we are putting in all of the safeguards today, making everything as safe as possible today. And then we create that map. If we continue to act responsibly on that roadmap, we, we will be better situated, better prepared for future harms. But I think the if we forget, if we don't focus on the here and now and we only focus on the very distant future, then we miss the opportunities. Many individuals are going to get sacri- sacrificed um, in the long run. So we really have to invest in the here and now and create this muscle memory, create these resources, create regulations that allow us to continue advancing, but doing it safely. I'm Dan Patterson. And for more interviews like this one, make sure you subscribe to the channel. And for the latest in emerging technology innovation, visit ZDNet.com.